This is BBC One in the South East. Now the news at 10 o'clock with Peter Sissons and Gillian Joseph. Britain's autumn deluge goes on, feeding the floods and the despair. It's the worst weather most can remember, with no relief in sight. And Tony Blair admits there must be more investment in flood protection. England's education watchdog resigns, teachers' unions say good riddance. And the Swede who managed England speaks of the challenge and why he's up to it. Here in the southeast, the Asian teenager murdered in prison by his racist cellmate. Tonight, a public inquiry is a step closer. The X-ray scanner that could bust the billion-pound cigarette smuggling trade. Good evening. The worst floods since 1947 are still gripping large parts of central and northern England tonight, bringing misery to thousands and making a mockery of tested flood defences. An inch of rain fell in many parts in a couple of hours, and more is forecast. Tony Blair, who visited the worst hit areas, said we'd have to face up to flooding becoming less rare and promised a lot more investment in flood protection. In central England, the Severn, on which stand Worcester, Shrewsbury and Bewdley, is giving most concern. In the north, it's the Derwent, the Ouse and the Air, which have inundated York, Moulton and Stamford Bridge. First to Worcester, and our reporter Richard Bilton. Tonight in Worcester, the army are moving people through the water. The bridge in the centre of the city is now closed. The floods too dangerous in the dark. Not very good, really. I've never seen it like this at all. I've lived here 40 years. The high waters arrive through the night. The people of Worcester, the latest living by the Severn, to see its filthy waters sweep through their homes. At 3 o'clock this morning, it was starting to come up and it just rapidly came within half an hour. It was just flooded in the other. In some places, the water rose too quickly. At this hotel, five people stranded, ladders and boats involved in their rescue. I was alone, but it wasn't cold, and the electric is working, <laughs> but I was alone. <laughs> the water in Worcester went further than homes. Flooding in the hospital boiler room led to drastic measures. <laughs> With heating and light in jeopardy, patients had to be moved. Ronald Coates, recovering from an operation, one of 67, to be shifted to a new site. We've got to look after the safety of people. and. I mean, it's no good if all the power goes. They would be in a desperate situation then, wouldn't they? All available ambulances were called in. Some people found themselves caught from both sides. Shirley Barnes was forced from her hospital bed as the waters approached her home. I'm worried about the flat. It's all flooded underneath, and the police won't let us back down there anyway because it's too flooded. So I'm glad to be going to Redditch to have the op. That's magic. Throughout the day, the rescues never stopped. Not always dramatic, but people forced from their homes as the water inched higher. It was advisable to come because the electrics might be switched off and we're all electric, you see. Further back up the Severn, the same bloated river causing the damage in Worcester was surveyed by the Prime Minister. He was in Bewdley to see at first hand the worst flooding in half a century. The flooding is appalling and for the people who've been moved out of their homes um, and, and businesses. It's a very serious problem for them indeed. And we've got to put in the right flood defences, which in fact ironically here is starting next week. And in the longer term we've got to do you know, more to combat the reasons why the climate's changing, not just here but right around Europe and the rest of the world. All along the Severn the story is the same. Hundreds of people move from their homes, businesses destroyed and the water still rising. Richard Bilton, BBC News, Worcester. The other area still badly affected is North Yorkshire. The flood defences in the city of York coped reasonably well, but there was water waste deep in other parts of the county, and the weather forecasters say there's more heavy rain on the way tonight. Robert Hall is there. In Stamford Bridge, Neil Townsend has made another depressing trip downstairs. What a devastation. Fridges full of bottles, light bulbs, shelves. Peanuts and crisps, everything in this fridge is absolutely no good whatsoever. 
48 hours ago, Neil was determined to sit it out with his family, but today the children, too frightened to remain marooned, were evacuated by police. He has opted to remain, at least whilst the power's on. In 1066, this village saw a famous English victory. Tonight, it faces defeat by the elements. Along the Derwent Valley, flood water from the North York Moors is spreading relentlessly through farms and properties. Blanche Stacy, 78 and suffering from arthritis, is preparing to leave her home in Elvington. She's seen floods before, but she's now unable to manage on her own. Absolutely fed up, but I mean, it's no good being... You just got, it's here and I've got to accept it. All that anyone can do is try and maintain some sort of normal life, and there are plenty of people willing to lend a hand. On the River Ouse at Neyburn, villagers found help on offer from international rescue. Teams accustomed to disasters abroad, ferrying flood defences to family emergencies far closer to home. Downstream, more substantial defences are offering vital protection to the city of York, but the council's prepared for the worst. This control centre is likely to become far busier over the next 24 hours. Well, our priority is to try and keep the city moving and to protect those people who, those vulnerable people who can't help themselves, those who are trapped in their homes. There are a number of people who've had to evacuate their homes and of course we're helping them as well. Tonight with the army assisting on the streets and Green Goddess fire engines here to help the emergency services, the city is on full alert. Robert Hall, BBC News, North Yorkshire. In parts of southern England, floodwaters have begun to recede, leaving people to start the huge clean-up. Many councils have had to put emergency plans into operation, costing them and their insurers millions of pounds. But it'll take days before all road and rail services return to normal. In a week of floods that could yet prove the worst this century, more than 3,000 homes and offices have been inundated with flood water. Throughout England and Wales, the priority now is to rehouse people and repair their homes. Temporary refuges, like the village hall in Bishop's Taunton in Devon, provide emergency overnight accommodation, but insurance companies and local councils must find rented homes to tide them over for longer while their permanent houses are repaired. People need furnished accommodation. They've lost just about everything uh, in this disastrous flood, and uh, that's, that's proven a bit difficult. Uh, that, that's uh, few and far between, and of course, people naturally want to be uh, close to their homes. Do you want me to give you our number or...? Repairing the infrastructure is the next priority. The early family are trapped on their farm near Barnstable because the bridge over this river has been swept away. At this stage, dealing with the emergency is the responsibility of the Environment Agency and local councils, but it's expensive. Although councils will do what they can now, the costs to them of providing these services are severe and we need the government to help. Money's also needed for the rail network. Damaged lines could be closed for a month. Commuters nationwide face long delays. At the Environment Agency Flood Centre tonight, the Deputy Prime Minister John Prescott called for a new national emergency plan. What we've really got to do is to ask ourselves, could we do an awful lot more? Can we make it more responsive? So not so many people have to suffer, suffer from these kind of uh, weather changes. Over 300 flood alerts of varying degrees of severity remain in force this evening and there's likely to be more rain throughout the weekend. Margaret Gilmore, BBC News. In a minute we'll get the latest from York with Robert Hall. But first, Richard Bilton is in Worcester. Richard, any sign yet of the waters being in retreat? Sadly, not here, although the rain has eased off, which is something. The water continues to rise here and will until tomorrow when it will peak at about 5.1 metres. Downstream, of course, they're preparing themselves now for the worst, for the floods that have, have devastated everything along the Severn. Upstream, though, there is some good news. At Bewdley, where the Prime Minister was today, the water has peaked. And further up into North Wales, the water that's filling this river is starting to slow down. Though, of course, there are fears of, of storms this coming weekend. What's worrying people now, though, is the rural communities in this area, the help line is getting about a call a minute at the moment. In Worcester here and in Bewdley there are emergency centres for those people who've been moved out of their homes but tonight and through tomorrow people will be concentrating on those living in the country. Richard Bilton in Worcester, thank you. Robert Hall joins us uh, from York now. Robert, from the look of you, um, York isn't over the worst yet. 
No, I don't think it is, Peter. This is one of the main routes into the city centre. All but two of the ten major roads in and out are blocked tonight. Although we've noticed while we've been here that this water level's dropped about six inches. Not much consolation to the authorities who expect uh, 20 to 40 millimetres of rain over 12 hours. Interestingly, we came down here to show you that the flood markings on the wall there show us that we're at levels last reached in the early 1980s. The river's about... Uh, it's at about 16 feet above normal level. It's got another foot to go before it overtops the flood defences. That would threaten about 750 homes. Everyone here hopes that that won't happen. But as we've seen from those pictures of the army and the green goddesses, the plan is in place to deal with any eventuality. Robert Hall in York. Thank you. Now, Chris Woodhead, the Chief Inspector of Schools in England, has resigned. Mr Woodhead has been a controversial figure. He was given the job by the Conservative government, but was strongly backed and reappointed by Labour. He's leaving to start a new career as a writer on the Daily Telegraph. Our education correspondent, Mike Baker, reports. What I did say was that A-levels need to become more difficult. Right up until yesterday, before a Commons committee, Mr Woodhead was causing waves. Ambitious, idealistic, charismatic and articulate, he has often seemed more politician than civil servant. His refusal to pull punches with underperforming teachers brought controversy, and even MPs felt the edge of his tongue. We need, in the future, to make A-levels even more demanding than they are at present. And I'm sorry if you find it difficult to hold those two propositions in your head, but I don't think it's that hard, really. Appointed by the Conservatives and, to teachers' horror, reappointed by Labour, Mr Woodhead had the zeal and energy of a convert, moving from progressive English teacher to chief scourge of low standards. He once described 15,000 teachers as incompetent and said too many schools were letting down pupils. Tonight, teachers' leaders were delighted to see him gone. I think head teachers will be very pleased and I think that they will look forward to a, a new relationship with Ofsted and the government um, in, in the future. But some felt his aggressive style no longer suited Labour's purpose at a time when they need to recruit and keep teachers, a view confirmed by Minister's careful choice of words tonight. Well, I think Chris's style was one of abrasiveness and I think it had its place. I think we do have a task in raising the morale and motivation of teachers. We want excellence in every school. That does mean rigour. It means rooting out failure. But it does also mean spreading and rejoicing in excellence. Tonight, during a school visit, Mr Woodhead defended his style. Well, I don't think I've been abrasive in the sense that I've set out to ruffle feathers. What I've set out to do is to speak plainly. When schools open in the morning, many teachers will be rejoicing. But Mr Woodhead has played a key part in identifying where improvement is needed. Yet it seems he's now recognised that the next stage, winning teachers' support for change, will require a different style of leadership. Mike Baker, BBC News. An extreme Islamic group has claimed responsibility for a car bomb in West Jerusalem. It killed two Israelis and wounded ten others. The explosion came just as Israel and the Palestinians were due to make a statement on an agreement aimed at ending the recent violence. They said it would happen. It was only a matter of when. This crisis, which has seen almost everything else, now brought chaos to the crowded streets of Jewish West Jerusalem. The bomb was powerful. The two victims passing by had no chance. Both were Jewish. One was the daughter of the leader of one of Israel's political parties. Death to the Arabs, they chant. Such sentiments have rarely been far from the surface in recent weeks. Israel says the Palestinians must hunt down the bombers. We hold the Palestinian Authority responsible to put them back in jail and quickly if they are serious about ceasefire and by, if they are serious uh, about resuming the talks. It had appeared the two sides were pulling back from the brink. On the streets of the Gaza Strip, Palestinian policemen weren't quite letting the demonstrators have their own way. There's still no sign of a joint Israeli-Palestinian statement about an end to violence. Tonight, the Palestinian leader condemned the bombing in Jerusalem. We are against it completely. But said he was still waiting to hear from Israel. As the wreckage is removed, Israel says the bombing will not affect the truce agreed in the early hours of the morning. Talk of ceasefires and understanding sounds a little hollow after events like this. 
But Ehud Barak and Yasser Arafat know that other tests will follow. With each one, the job of ending this crisis gets a little harder. Paul Adams, BBC News, Jerusalem. Rail track says 170 miles of track needs to be relayed following checks to the lines after last month's Hatfield crash. Laying the new track is likely to take six months and some sections could be closed for up to 24 hours at a time. Rail users have been warned to expect more disruption. Clarence House has confirmed that the Queen Mother stumbled as she was getting into her car two days ago. It's thought she caught her foot on her dress and fell forwards into the car but was not injured. With less than two weeks to go before the expiry of the 60-day deadline set by the fuel protesters, the government has set out measures to prevent any further disruption. The announcement came as the oil giant Shell announced record annual profits. This time there's a plan to take on the fuel protesters. Tonight at this military fuel depot in Dorset, they're in the final phase of training 500 troops in case they're needed to keep essential supplies moving. At food depots, there'll be police protection in case they're targeted by protesters. The government is stockpiling its plans and rhetoric against wholesale disruption. The consequences of such disruption are obvious and they would hit the weakest and the most vulnerable first. There can be no justification for any such action. If scenes like this are seen again, ministers want the protesters to be seen as the villains, not the government. They mostly relied on persuasion, that some cases of alleged intimidation have been detailed by the Home Office. The pressure's on, and tonight, at least one protest leader is stepping back from future action at refinery gates. Are you looking to mount protests outside all refineries? No, nope. hasn't even been discussed. Okay, with, um, what about supermarkets and food distribution centres? Condemn it totally. The, no blockade protest or any... Condemn it totally. So is the climate turning against more disruption? If a crisis is avoided, the Tory leader, William Haig, would clearly like some of the credit. Peaceful protests do win public sympathy. Uh, but protests which cause immense disruption or massive inconvenience... Uh, for people which are not legal or not peaceful or amount to direct action will lose public support and rightly so. The entire press savaged the government in the summer. Tonight it's a coup for Labour that one normally sympathetic Fleet Street tabloid has come down hard against more disruption. My feeling from the readers is that they, they agree with the idea of this. They agree that there should be protests, but what they don't want to do is see hospitals suffering and pensioners suffering and people up and down the country running out of food and running out of petrol. Tonight, there have been scattered reports of panic buying around the country, though the oil companies say supplies are still plentiful. This is still a dangerous situation for the government, but ministers have had time to lay their plans and start to massage public opinion. Today's news of massive oil company profits may just help deflect resentment elsewhere. While it's clear that the government won't give the fuel protesters the kind of help they want, it's still up to the Chancellor in his big economic statement next week to buy back support from the public. John Pinar, BBC News, Westminster. The two international arms inspectors who've examined the IRA's weapons dumps say they're convinced the IRA is serious about the peace process. The inspectors, the South African Cyril Ramaphosa and the former Finnish Prime Minister Marty Artisari, were in Belfast briefing the political parties on their findings. The international weapons inspectors came to Belfast after briefing the Prime Minister. Their mission this time, to update the local pro-Good Friday Agreement parties. They've now carried out two inspections of IRA arms dumps and they're convinced the IRA is serious about the weapons issue. We've even been more convinced by their intentions after going back for a re-inspection and finding that the arms dumps had not been tampered with and that they have remained secure. So that has given us a great deal of confidence. Indeed, trust, or rather the lack of it, is the kernel of the latest political difficulties. Because unionists simply don't believe the IRA will keep its promise to decommission, the party last weekend backed David Trimble in banning Sinn Féin members of the devolved executive from meeting their Dublin ministerial counterparts. Unionists want the IRA to resume contact with the decommissioning body. The action that I took with regard to Sinn Féin minister was only taken because six months after Republicans promised that they'd initiate a process to put weapons beyond use. They haven't even started to talk uh, to the Deschastling Commission. 
And as soon as they engage substantively with the Sikh Dishashtan Commission, I'd be quite happy uh, to go back to normal. Sinn Féin leaders met the arms inspectors, but they were extremely angry at the sanction on their ministers taken by Mr Trimble. I do know that how these weeks play out and how the British government handles this, this current crisis could be terminal for the political process. The Northern Ireland Health Minister, a Sinn Féin member, will meet her southern counterpart tomorrow in the presence of the nationalist SDLP, all of them making a point of showing their anger at Mr Trimble's action. These are among the most fervently pro-Good Friday Agreement parties, and the divisions between them now show in just how much trouble the process is. Dennis Murray, BBC News, Belfast. With less than a week until the American elections, the latest polls give George W. Bush a narrow lead over Al Gore. The race for the White House is now being run at an ever more frantic pace, and as Stephen Sacker reports from Florida, negative tactics have become all important in the campaign's final days. We want Gore! We want Gore! Political passions rising in the Florida battleground. Bush supporters unwelcome at this Gore rally in Orlando. The vice president senses opportunity in a state which is a magnet to pensioners. His opponent, Gore claims, would undermine the pension system, known here as Social Security. Social Security itself is on the ballot. You will vote and you will choose, and I ask you to save Social Security when you vote on Tuesday. It is very much on the ballot. Gore is needlessly scaring the elderly, according to the Bush camp. Both sides know the stakes are high. Florida is the biggest single state where neither side has a clear lead. It is a huge prize, but even here, the candidates fly in and fly out in just a few hours. They can't afford to stop moving. George Bush dashing to Missouri today, where he's hanging on to a narrow lead. Bush has gone negative, too, on health care, lashing out at Gore, now labelled as the double-talking, big-spending Washington bureaucrat. He says he's for a step-by-step -step plan for universal coverage. No, folks. He's for a hop, skip, and a jump to nationalize health care. Much of the campaign's venoms now in TV ads. On June 7, 1998, in Texas, my father was killed. This stark ad revives the story of a black man dragged to his death in George Bush's Texas. Paid for by a black group, it's designed to rally support for Gore. With tension rising and the polls tight, one familiar couple was allowed to vote early today in Texas. Safe to assume that George W. Bush received the votes of his mother and father. But for the rest of the country, five days left. And Al Gore in Florida, still straining every sinew to reach out to voters who've yet to make up their minds. Stephen Sacker, BBC News, Florida. Chess has a new world champion after Garry Kasparov, the number one player for the past 15 years, tonight conceded defeat against one of his former pupils, Vladimir Kramnik. Kramnik won the 16-game series after two victories and a series of drawn matches. Kasparov could only manage a draw again tonight. Looking bewildered and exhausted, he has yet to explain his sudden loss of form. The New England football coach Sven Joran Eriksson has been talking publicly for the first time about his appointment. He insisted he can bring success to the national team and said he was honoured to be given the job. Through a blaze of flashlights, England and Swede entered the land where national team managers can end up depicted as turnips. But not even the prospect of a future mangling from the press could dissuade Sven Joran Eriksson from saying yes when the FA came knocking. One of the most prestige job you can have as a manager. I'm very, very honoured and very, very pleased. And um, I hope to do him well, of course. But uh, you can't say no when uh, you've been offered the manager of, of England. Throughout, his answers were both courteous and frank. No, he didn't know enough yet about English domestic football. Yes, his nationality would be an issue for some people. But ultimately, he'd be judged on how England perform and whether he can turn a side in moribund limbo into winners. 
You'll never lead out a side at the old Wembley now, but among the galaxy of stars who've graced its stage, gathering tonight to bid it a final farewell, one in particular thought England had made a shrewd choice. Ericsson is a very good coach, one of the most uh, talented coach in the moment in modern football. This is no doubt, I think, could be uh, very important to, to, to the England team as a coach like that. But that doesn't mean that he's going to win the World Cup. <laughs> Ericsson, meanwhile, is back in Rome, carrying on with his day job as manager of Lazio. Having got their man, the FA are now desperately hoping to prize him away from Italy before next spring's two vital World Cup qualifying games. Kevin Geary, BBC News. It's just after 25 past 10, and I'll be back a little later with the latest on the day's headlines. But now, the news where you are. The latest in the southeast. Good evening. The family of a 19-year-old Asian man who was killed in prison by a racist cellmate are tonight one step closer to getting the public inquiry they've been demanding. Zahid Mubarak was battered to death by a known racist at Feltham Young Offenders Institution. They're still grieving like any family would be, but the Mubaraks are also looking for answers. This could be anyone's child. He was doing a, a, a short sentence. He was put into a cell um, with a known violent racist. And uh, as a result, my nephew lost his life. The family and their solicitor, Imran Khan, had a meeting with the Home Office Minister, Paul Botang, and the head of the prison service today. They both support the need for a full inquiry. We hope to establish terms of reference which will enable us to have a wide-ranging inquiry which will look specifically at uh, Feltham and what precisely happened to Zahid Mubarak. It was the last few hours of Zahid Mubarak's 90-day sentence at Feltham Young Offenders Institution when he was killed. He'd been sent there for shoplifting seven pounds worth of goods and interfering with a car. He'd never been in trouble before then and he'd wanted to join the army upon his release. It was his cellmate, 20-year-old Robert Stewart, who beat him to death with a wooden table leg during the night. He'd had a long record of violent crime, had RIP tattooed on his forehead and had been diagnosed with a personality disorder. It's now emerged that he'd sent racially threatening letters during his time in Feltham, including one expressing admiration for the killers of Stephen Lawrence. Officers, though, had failed to censor them. Anti-racist campaigners now say this latest tragedy in a long line of problems for Feltham may prove to be a defining moment for the prison service, just as the Stephen Lawrence murder was for the Metropolitan Police. Sarah Morris, Newsroom South East, at the Home Office. Workers at the Ford car plant in Dagenham are to be balloted on strike action over plans to end car production. Ford says its European assembly plants are over capacity. It wants to build diesel engines at Dagenham instead. An independent study has warned that up to 4,000 jobs could be lost. A man who tried to set up a website for rapists is tonight beginning a life sentence for murdering a young mother. 31-year-old David Ferguson had denied killing Susan Kent at her home, but he was convicted today at Maidstone Crown Court. Susan Kent's family were at Maidstone Court today as the jury returned a unanimous guilty verdict. In a five-week murder trial, they'd heard the prosecution's picture of David Ferguson as a pervert who dreamed of raping and stabbing women. Mrs Kent, a mother of two who worked as a school cook, became the victim of his deviant fantasies after he tied her up, sexually assaulted her and then stabbed her to death. Ferguson is an evil man who has been brought to justice by the Kent police and the criminal justice system. But 20 years is not enough. These are the last images of Mrs Kent alive, caught on security cameras while shopping hours before her death. In a reconstruction, a policewoman demonstrated her last known movements. Her body was found in her bedroom here at Birch Grove in Gillingham. Just feel sick that anybody could contemplate doing that. Sick to the stomach. There was an internet dimension to the police investigation, although detectives linked Ferguson to the killing through DNA blood samples. But they also discovered he kept in touch with other perverts by email and had even tried to set up an internet rape club. He planned this through the use of the internet. He crossed the line from fantasy into reality and snuffed the life of this young woman and deprived two young children of their mother. 
Mr. Justice Hidden told Ferguson he'd taken a life with the worst cruelty, evil and savagery. He thanked juries in the case, saying they'd had to listen to things which are hardly human. Robin Gibson, News from South East, Maidstone. Customs officers have unveiled their latest weapon against cigarette smuggling, a new X-ray scanner truck which can search lorries for contraband cigarettes in just three minutes. It's the latest attempt to reduce the illegal trade, which cost two and a half billion pounds in lost taxes last year. From the outside, it looks like any other big truck, but it's the sophisticated X-ray equipment inside which makes this one special. It'll detect bombs and guns, but this one's on the lookout for carefully concealed tobacco, a weapon against smugglers from across Europe who are making a killing. In the last few years, we've seen criminal gangs, worldwide criminal gangs, move systematically into the shipment of cigarettes into the UK illegally in containers. Harish Tadir is a victim of the smugglers. Tobacco used to be the mainstay of his business. Now he's struggling to survive. It's affected tremendously over the years. My takings is 50% down because of the smuggling of cigarettes. One in five cigarettes smoked in the UK are smuggled. That represents a loss to the exchequer of £2.5 billion. And smugglers are growing increasingly cunning, concealing cigarettes in furniture, for example, and here in tabletops, even vats of olives. This is the first of the X-ray scanners, but eventually there'll be five in operation throughout the UK. But only when we see cigarette smugglers being prosecuted in the courts will we know if they're being really successful. Duncan Williamson, Newsroom South East, Tilbury. A row's broken out over one of London's most popular bonfire night displays. Labour opposition councillors in Islington protested tonight at planned cuts of more than half a million pounds, which they say have caused the cancellation of the firework party at Highbury Fields. But the ruling Liberal Democrats say police had already ruled out the event on safety grounds. Wembley Stadium is tonight staging its very final event before the bulldozers move in next week to make way for a new stadium. The familiar twin towers, which have dominated the North London skyline for nearly 80 years, will be reduced to rubble. But they've been lit up this evening for a charity ball sponsored by the insurance firm AXA. That's it. Now it's back to Peter Sissons. And the main news tonight, there's no sign of an early end to the flooding which has brought misery to towns on the River Severn and on the rivers Ouse and Derwent in northern England. Tony Blair saw some of the worst hit areas for himself today and promised more spending on flood defences. And Chris Woodhead, the often controversial Chief Inspector of Schools in England, has resigned. Newsnight is starting now over on BBC Two, but from the 10 o'clock news, good night. For information on travel conditions in your area, tune to your BBC local radio station for regular updates. Good evening to you. Please don't shoot the messenger, I think, is the message, because I'm afraid to say that in some parts of the country the weather's likely to get worse before it gets better, and it may well be quite a long time before it gets better, because we're going to get rid of the area of low pressure that's given us the heavy rain today. That'll move off up into the Norwegian Sea, but it's only a brief respite before yet another one comes in from the Atlantic, loads of isobars, so again it'll be turning wet and windy in a good number of places. And I'm saying by that, Sunday through into Tuesday, and mostly across England and Wales, where there could well be as much as 50 millimetres of rain again. And we've still got some heavy rain across that northern part of the country where we could at least want it, and we have some rain working its way across the south too. Some pretty violent uh, hail and thunderstorms coming in across the Sussex and Kent coast. So I think for some hours yet across much of northern England we are going to have some further heavy rain, and that rain has incidentally been turning to snow in some areas, more particularly over the hillier parts. And that rain is falling, of course, where we just don't want it, as I said a while ago, because we still have some severe flood warnings in northern Northern England, parts of Wales and the Midlands. Now that rain will very slowly pull away I think during the rest of the night. It will still be affecting some eastern coastal counties even at the end of the night and at the same time be pushing up into eastern Scotland. Those showers lingering too along the Channel coast there but the showers inland I think should mostly fade away by the end of the night and temperatures dipping down to about four degrees already below freezing in some sheltered parts of central Scotland so there'll be a frost there. 
Still perhaps some outbreaks of rain around these eastern counties first thing in the morning. That'll move away. Then it should be a brighter and drier day, really, all around. Not dry, though, by any means. There will be some scattered showers, and still some of those showers, I think, around the coast, especially the Channel Coast, quite heavy with some hail and thunder. And it's going to be still pretty breezy in most parts of the country, too. So that's going to make it feel rather on the chilly side. Temperatures of 10 or 11 degrees at best. And then, as we saw a while ago with that pressure sequence, it should be a little bit of a brief respite when we move into Saturday. Again, there might just be one or two showers here and there, but they're going to be light and pretty well scattered in many central and eastern areas should, I think, get away with a dry day with a fair amount of sunshine. But make the most of it, because it isn't going to last. And come Sunday, we are going to find yet another spell of wet and very windy weather sweeping up from the southwest across most parts of England and Wales. Again, we could well find some sleet or snow over those northern hills. So I'm afraid not, news, no, not good news for anybody. More details on our website. The Catholic Church in Wales has seen two of its priests jailed for child abuse. I did regard it as an honor that the priest wanted to come into our home. Archbishop John Ward failed to stop the crimes. Obviously, there were some lacks in what, whatever was done in Cardiff. Now questions are being raised about a man who answers only to the Pope. The man at the top has to take responsibility for what's gone on. Panorama, exposing the truth, Sunday at 10.15 on BBC One. Friday night on New Look BBC One. At nine, have we got news for you? Well, I thought if Angus can understand it, I can pick it up in a few minutes. <laughs> then Dawn French gets that loving feeling at 9.30. And after the Vicar of Bibley, join us for the BBC 10 o'clock news. New Look, Friday night on BBC One.